Praise the living Jesus. If you please open with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter. Matthew 4. And I will read verses 8 to 10. And again the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus, then said the word of God, then says the wonderful one. He said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The word of the Lord is telling you this morning, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of His holy word in Jesus' name. And before I continue, I want to say thank you to every member of Cornerstone. I want to especially thank the women. Thank you for your show of love. Where I come from, every time you remember the goodness somebody has done to you, take your phone and call them. But because of dignity, I can't be calling you at the middle of the night. The Lord bless you. My Lord will beautify you. Thank you. And our daddies as well. I thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for the show of love during my birthday in the past week. And I want to thank our pastor for the opportunity that has given me to be here today. And I want to thank everybody that has tuned in uh, from home. That, uh, and I say thank you for joining us today, the Lord God Almighty, the wonderful, we visit you in Jesus' name. In, in the redeemed Christian Church of God, we are in the season of the wonderful. Praise the Lord, wonderful. You know, if we do not encounter the wonders of God, it's not because it ceases to be wonderful. Somebody say wonderful. Wonderful. He has already, you know, he has decided that it's going to be wonderful in our lives. And as a preacher would say, he said, if that does not light your wood, if it doesn't light your day, your wood is wet. Praise the Lord. I told a testimony last week. You know, by the time th that thing was happening, I totally forgot. Maybe I, you know, I never, I totally forgotten that the thing for this year's convention is wonderful. But the Holy Spirit does say, whatever, whenever you think about this situation, says wonderful. Praise the Lord. So I don't know what you're facing this morning. Wonderful. And the word God gave me yesterday was that tell somebody. I am the Lord. Actually, let me open it because I wrote it down. I wrote it down. He said, okay, that I am the Lord, I change not. And that I'm still wonderful. That's the word of God to somebody this morning. Praise the Lord. I've titled this sermon, Deal or No Deal. Praise the Lord. Deal or no deal. And that is from the passage that we saw. Deal or no deal is a television, uh, is a show, like a game show on TV. And the, 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 the participants are asked to pick so many boxes. You take a box that you keep. So you continue to open other boxes. They will not reveal to you what you have in that box. So you continue to open other boxes. And in the, we show you certain amount of money, maybe one thousand, one million dollars, you'll be banking them. And the banker will give you an offer that you can see. So they will give you an offer of twenty thousand dollars. You can decide to say it's a deal or no deal. Deal, deal means that you're going to take it. 
No deal means no, I want to keep to the box I have in my hand. And it continues and continues. And that's why I think that are you going to know why I, I did that. And most of the time, the banker is out to cheat you. So you could see this great amount of money. Oh, it's, uh, now I have $500,000. So when you take the deal, they will open your box for you, and you find that you actually have $900,000. So that's how they, I mean, they cheat people out of what you already possess. And that's what we see in the scenario in the book of Matthew chapter, eight, uh, chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. The, uh, Saint, Satan was presenting an offer to Jesus. So Jesus said, no deal. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad he said no deal? So what we're talking about actually today is compromise. And the Bible has the, the dictionary, online dictionary, says it's an agreement or settlement of a dispute that is reached by each side making consensus. They both agree. Ils ont tous un accord. It could be an arrangement. That, those are the synonyms for Ça peut être un compromise. Making an arrangement. Bargaining. To concur. Consensus. To make a deal. And to be understand, you know, to understand somebody's situation and agree with them. And on the other hand, uh, it's also defined as impairment. As by disease or injury. It could be compromise, to compromise immunity. You see that a lot. When somebody, like people with COVID, is because their, their natural immunity has been compromised. Some people have been phoned before, they will tell you your identity has been compromised. So it can mean to weaken or expose to danger. So from those definitions, we can see that compromise has two sides. So we see from, like, uh, from the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, the devil gave him an offer. He turned it down. And also, uh, in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He despised the shame. And now he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So now in that place you say Jesus made a compromise. Praise the Lord. So every day we are faced with a choice to make a compromise or not. And we all make compromise on a daily basis, depending on the way we look at it. For you to be here this morning, you have compromised your comfort to a certain level, depending on how you see it. For somebody at home watching from home, they have compromised, you know, for them to get out of bed, even to wake up on a Sunday morning, you are, you know, compromising to a certain extent. So, so if we play, you know, a simple game now, and, you know, people have said, okay, tithe is from the Old Testament. You don't need to pay your tithe. Is that a deal or no deal? Praise the Lord. 
It's not jail, praise the Lord. So, in, in simple matters like that, we play this game every day. We play it in our thoughts. Because Jesus Christ says certain things when you think about them, you've already done them. He said you have already compromised. So, we all make compromise on a daily basis. When there are, there are some people, you have your specs for the kind of husband you want. I think, I think some people can, they can identify with that. But the man, you know, when the man came, he didn't look like anything that you have in your books. So you do what? You compromise. Praise the Lord. So that's the way the compromise plays out. Sometimes because of what, you know, what you want to achieve, you compromise your comfort. Some people don't eat certain kind of food. But since you are married, you eat them anyway. And there was a time my husband came. He was all out to impress me. Everybody, look at me, okay? So he was all out to impress me. And he got this, you know, this commodity. And said, now you know how I can spoil somebody. I said, okay, what have you got? And he opened the bag. I said, I don't like that. And he said, but you always eat it. I said, yeah, because nobody eats it in the house. So I've compromised for that, you know, that long. Because I want to be a good steward of the resources. And, you know, I don't want to force anybody, anything on anybody. So we all compromise on a daily basis. First Corinthians 9, 22 to 23. There are a, lot, a, a, a long list of you know uh, things. It started you know earlier on in the in the, in the chapter. But I'll read from 22 to 23. First Corinthians 9, 22 to 23. Apostle Paul says, "To the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men." that I might by all means save some. Now, this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. So he's telling all that when it comes to certain things, I don't have a standard. He said, I compromise some things. Because when you look at the, when you look at what we say we compromise, I'm the only, only one that always gives something up. Why is it that it's only me? I have to preach you first. Apostle Paul is saying, no, it's not a compromise to me. Because what we think as compromise, actually, you are using it to uphold the standard of God. We are doing it not to compromise. You know what Abraham called it? Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. He was going to give his all to God. He was going to return to square one. God already told him, send Ishmael out. And the only one that was left with him, God said, take it. Take him. Go and sacrifice him. After three days' journey, he left the servant behind. And he said, I'm going to worship. So whatever you think you are giving up in your home, what is it to you? What is it? It's your worship. It's your we, we read Psalm 20 this morning. I love that song. He said, May the Lord remember your sacrifices. He did not call it sacrifice. Abraham didn't even say it's a sacrifice. He said, It is my worship. 
Praise the Lord. So, as we, are, we, we had the past two weeks, it, said it depends on the way you look at it. You are doing it to uphold the standard of God. So, when deals are presented before us, these are the questions that will help us to know, is this a good deal for me or is it a no deal? One, does it promote God's perfect will? Jesus is our perfect example. In the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Matthew 26, 39, the Bible says he went further again. And he said, Lord, if you would take this cup away. But not my will, but yours be done. Because he knew the perfect will of God. He said, I want your will to be done. It's not easy for me to be the target of insults every time. He said, but the will of God is for me to promote peace in my home. He said, I would rather be the target of everybody. It's not popular to be a Christian in my workplace. But I still choose to identify with Christ. Because it is the will of God for me. Second, number two. Does it promote the gospel? Does it promote the gospel? Apostle Paul tells us in that first Corinthians chapter 9. He said, I do all this for the gospel's sake. Some of us, there are people that we rather not like and we would rather not talk to. Because, but because we see them through the lens of Christ. You see them differently. Anything we're doing, what we're saying, does it promote the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's why it breaks my heart. When people are analyzing the Antichrist, and they are, you know, they are bringing out a barrage of insults, and crosses. That's not what we're supposed to do with Antichrist. As Pastor told us this morning, it means it's more time to be nice. It's more time to bring out the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit. It's the time to evangelize your word. And we don't impress anybody by insulting. That's why people will tell you, you mentioned certain group of people this morning. Some Christians will tell you they would rather be with them. Because they exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. What we cannot find in the church either. So that's a trick of the enemy. Is this something that is promoting the gospel? When I want to exercise that right, will it draw people closer or will it send them off? And number three, is there any display of the fruit of the Spirit? When you want to say it's a deal, or you want to decline it, check. Does he exhibit any fruit of the Spirit? We are all familiar with Galatians 5, 22-23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and we go on and on, gentleness, self-control, and all. You know, there's one interesting thing. A lot of times when we see the, you know, the least and the least, we tell ourselves, I don't have grace for that. But Jesus Christ tells us in several places in, in Matthew chapter 7. He said, by this fruit, they will know you. He said, by your fruit, they will know you. First Corinthians chapter 13. 
He, you know, he listed a lot of things that, you know, if you speak in tongues, if you call and raise people from the dead, even if you speak and you can even cause people to die, it doesn't matter at all. He said, but by your love, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit. He said, that's how people will identify you. So we need to look when I'm making my decisions. Does it display the fruit of the Spirit? Does it, does it show that I have Holy Spirit living with me? Does it show that I have been with Christ? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ask your neighbor, deal or no deal? Another number four, does he promote peace? Does he promote peace? Romans 12, 18. The Bible tells us that as, as possible, as it, I mean, as much as possible, as it lies with you, with you, praise the Lord, not with your neighbor, say as much as possible, as much as it depends on me, I will be at peace with all men. Praise the Lord. The fact that somebody insults you does not mean that you cannot, it, it, I mean, it lies with you to greet them or not. You, you cannot control somebody's answers, but you can control whether you say hi, hello, or something. So that part that lies with you, that promotes peace, the Bible tells us to use it. Then we know that we're not compromising. We're upholding the standard of God. Number five, is it magnifying the flesh or putting it to death? Is this thing fulfilling the loss of my flesh? Or is it depriving the flesh so that my spirit can be edified? Galatians 5.24 the Bible says, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So I need to know if I'm compromised, if that thing is to, you know, contrary to, to glorifying God, it's edifying my flesh, it's exalting and magnifying my flesh at the expense of my spirit. Num Number six. Does it promote growth and edification? Is it edifying my spirit? Is it, is it, is it edifying my body? That's one thing we forget. That as a spiritual being, Possessing a soul and living in a body, we have a duty to take care of our body. We have a duty to take care of our bodies. But we rather compromise on that. And then we go and fast and pray. I want to tell us this morning, sincerely, we need to pay attention to what we do with our bodies. Let's pay attention to what we eat. Uh, the Bible tells us that physical exercise profits a little. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't think you're happy with me this morning. Pay attention to what you eat. You know, long time ago I was telling somebody that you're eating too much meat. And the person, the person told me, even the children of Israelites. Ah, in Exodus chapter 12. <laughs> that God said they should eat a whole ram. 
The last time I read Exodus, chapter 12, even God told them, if it's too big for your household, yeah. if there is leftover, praise the Lord, there's a place for leftover. You don't have to consume everything. We don't have to consume. It's true. So, say, uh, we have fridge now. There won't be leftover. You save it to tomorrow. Save it for another. Share with other people. So, because we can afford it, does not mean we need to eat it. Someone said, if you have a single coat and you're going to wear it for under than 20 years, you need to take it very good care of it. So, like, is it a defined? When you are eating that gummies and giving our children gummies and all dogs. All dogs is carcinogenic. WHO, not me. All the processed meat, they are carcinogenic. You know, it touches my heart because the, the time we need to use to go and evangelize, we are praying for ourselves. We, are, we, will, we will not become victims in Jesus' name. It's like we have become victims of circumstances. We shouldn't be. We need to, we need to strategize. Second Peter 3, 17 to 18. He said, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also form from your steadfastness, be led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forevermore. Amen. So we need to grow. That means, you know, is it edifying? Is it causing me to grow? Is it helping me to grow? Whatever we're going to do, is it, will, will it edify me spiritually? We, the Bible says we should grow in grace. And we grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number seven, does it, does it edify others? Does it edify others? The word of my mouth. Does it help others? There's a, uh, they say, whatever word I will proceed out of your mouth, let it be good. I, I, but what is good for, I mean, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification? That he may impart grace to the hearers. Ephesians 4.29. So let us watch the word of our mouth. Let's watch our attitude. When some people look at you, you go back home and look in the mirror. It's true. Let our attitude be the one that, you know, when somebody, somebody will feel like a million bucks, you're more than a million, by the way, but you, you know, you, you feel good about yourself. Let people feel good around you. Whatever we do or say. And number eight, the final word. Does it align with God's covenant? What my choices are. Does it align with the, with the covenant of God, with the word of God? Or does it contradict it? That's how we go to know, okay, that's a good deal, that's good. That's what the Word of God says. But not the one that is taken out of context. In Genesis chapter 15, after uh, Abraham warred uh, against, uh, when, he war, you know, when he went to rescue his uh, Lot, when he went to rescue Lot, after he returned, God appeared to him in, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 15. And God said, I am, I am your exceeding great reward. And you wonder, why did God say that? He went to war. They offered him 
substances. On lui a offert des substances. He said, no, I don't want. Il a dit, non, je veux pas. And God appeared to him and said, I'm your reward. Because those items, they are items of Sodom. We have to watch when we're counting our gains and we're saying, you know, the loot of the righteous will be mine and all those things. We have to watch out. Is it in line with the Word of God? Praise the Lord. So what we don't compromise, those are the ancient landmarks. That's what the Bible calls them. Cause them. They don't shift. Once we, once we try to use this question, of course there are several questions, but I just give us this for because of our time. Are they in align with this? Do, would they, would they try? Can they, can they, I mean, can they be proven by these questions? Would they withstand the test of these questions when we're making our decisions? Je me dis parce qu'elle cause du temps, mais quand vous les analysez, est-ce que c'est en accord avec? So what are the things that make us to compromise? Qu'est-ce que les choses qui font que nous compromettons? First, we can be deceived. Premièrement, nous pouvons être déçus. You could be deceived. Vous pouvez être déçus. We see in Joshua chapter 9. Nous vivons en Josué 9. When the Gibeonites came. Quand les Gibeonites sont venus. They came to Joshua to make a deal. Another deal, you see, deal. Et ils sont venus avec so we have to be in the spirit. The Bible says we should test all spirit. Because before you say yes to something, to, to that, you know, that weekend shift with double double money. I, I used to work a lot of weekend shift. Look at it. Will it allow me to come to church? If you have an option. We have to test all spirit before we before we agree on things. So we could be deceived into compromise. We can compromise because it's inconvenient. It's just convenient to compromise. It's, uh, it's you know, you can, I, I'd rather sleep than pray. Compromise. It was easy for Abraham Okay, let's go to waiting and waiting. I'm not even sure the poor man told the wife about what God told him. He just accepted. Okay, let's go into your maid. Convenience. We, we need to be careful of convenient options. It could be because of pressure. Pressure. Uh, there's a prophet that was sent, sent to to Israel in 1 Kings chapter 13. The man was on a mission. And he was almost, he has almost finished his mission. But he was intercepted. You will not be intercepted in Jesus' name. You will not fall victim in the battle of life in the name of Jesus. But he was intercepted and the, the, old, the old prophet pressured him into compromise. Ignorance of forgetfulness. When, when I, when my attention, when I, when I, I, do, I mean, I, I just saw, I just noticed in uh, Psalm 103 verse 18. Psalm 103 verse 18. And the Bible says, to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments. So that means it's those that don't remember his commandments, they will, they will compromise. So we cannot, we cannot afford to forget. We heard last week about what to remember. We cannot uh, you know, we cannot afford to forget to uh, to obey the commandment of God. We cannot afford to forget the word of God. When when we lack the word of God, too, when we are ignorant of the word of God, we will compromise. That's why the Bible tells us in Joshua 1.8, 
Joshua 1 8, the word of the, the word of this law shall not depart from your mouth. He says you constantly be between your face, between your eyes. You memorize it. You 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 memorize it. You you say it. You decree it. You paste it. So that it's everywhere. Because if we don't have the word of God for time, we are going to forget it. Some of us, what we learned in grade one, we can still remember. But the word, even the one that I've spoken earlier today, some of us, we have forgotten. So the word of the Lord is powerful. To deliver us. Another thing is we need to guard our thoughts. On guarded thoughts, we need to compromise. If our thoughts are not guarded, and Jesus Christ warned us, He said, if you think certain things, you've already compromised your integrity. There's a book. What's on your mind? Very small book. I recommend that everybody reads it. It tells, I mean, it, just example, like a life example of people that compromised, but they've already had it in their thoughts. So our attitude and behavior they start from the way we think. The behavior we are going to adopt starts from our thoughts. Another thing that makes people to compromise indecision. You have not made up your mind, you not compromise. A lot of times, anything goes. When we don't decide that we're not going to sin, Holy Spirit cannot help us. The Bible says you always make a way of escape. When you cry to God, you know, in your closet, and say, God, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, sometimes we say, once we say, uh, what we ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness is different from repentance. Sometimes we, we ask for forgiveness in desperation because we need another miracle. We are not ready to repent of that sin. And the devil is very tricky. As you are doing that, he will just flash it before your face, in your mind. And we say, God, for you understand, I'm a man. We need to make, you know, a decision. We need to be intentional about not compromising. And that's when the Lord arises on our behalf. And the last one, lack of trust in God. When we don't trust in God, it just means we don't have faith. When there's no faith, then, you know, uh, nature does not allow for a vacuum. Fear will be present. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And without faith, it means we trust Satan. So we go for all his deals all the time. We always go for his deals all the time. So we need to trust God. The Bible tells us that it's when we have faith that we start living. The just shall live by his faith. We cannot afford to lack in faith. We cannot afford to build up our faith. 
Nous ne pouvons pas nous permettre de ne pas bâtir sur notre foi. We cannot afford not to have faith. I know for myself, I cannot afford not to trust God. Because the last time my parents trust the devil, when your parents trusted the devil, they became naked. Shall we rise on our feet this morning? And it's the Lord of glory himself. The one they decided to turn down his deal. He was the one that came to their rescue. So I cannot afford not to trust him. Think to yourself, can you afford not to trust God? He is a holy God. He is holy, he's worthy, he's worthy to be trusted. The Bible tells us he's holy, because of that he cannot lie. Whatever he has told you, Whatever promise he has given you, he is well able to perform. Is there anywhere you have compromised? You have to trust in the word of God that he is able to forgive you. You have to trust in the blood of Jesus. That he is able to wipe you of all unrighteousness. Do, do you trust the blood to wipe you or for your past unrighteousness? Do you trust the blood? Do you trust the power of the name of Jesus to deliver you, to deliver you from every shackle? Do you trust his power? His ability to make you rich, to bless you, to bless you, said the blessing of the Lord, he make it rich without any sorrow. Do you trust that? We cannot afford not to trust. Because the box you have, your own package, you have everything you need. We cannot afford to agree to another deal. That is contrary. Just search yourself this morning. Search yourself. And say, Lord, I know I have compromised in this. I still have a tendency to compromise in this. Are you making decision? Now, like never before. We need to maintain our stance. We need to maintain our stand in Christ. We need to pick a side. We read this morning from the Sunday School Manual. They said the Antichrist is coming to destroy the weak Christians. Com compromise is the greatest tragedy in the church today. The, the great weapon of the Antichrist. The great weapon of Satan. Speak to the Lord this morning. Speak to him this morning. I have no power of my own. Lord, help me. Father, help me. 